out there and you bash into a bunch of other guys, you sweat a lot. I mean, it's just another subculture, breaking rules, pecking orders, that type of thing. See, all the kids who are outsiders everywhere else, they come there to be together. Instant acceptance. I'm not listening to the sociology report from a guy in Scottish plaid bondage pants. <laughs> yourself for the mic. Okay, my name is Al, Al de Malanta. I have a band called The Throw. I used to be in a band called Dead Ends back in the 80s. And I used to be the lead guitar player and vocalist of Dead Ends until around 88, 89. We sort of lay low for a while and then came back to the scene in 96. There, now I have a band called Throw. We play basically the same thing. Um, a little a little bit of hardcore, a little bit of thrash, and a whole lot of punk. <laughs> Something like that. So for all my friends from uh, Rumapi, straight out of the pages of Shock and Awe, we've got Al from, from Dead Ends. Yes. Uh, we're sitting right now in Demiurge <coughs> Digital Studios in Makati, Metro Manila, um, sitting in a corner, taking pictures and trying to be quiet is uh, our friend Ian, Ian from uh, Demiurge and Brimstone and Fire, uh, who I've referred to before as the Virgil in my uh, my Descent into the Inferno of the local scene, and uh, he he was uh, very kind enough to schedule this interview for us, and I appreciate that a lot. And we're gonna see if we can uh, we can get him to break his silence and uh, come anytime, in. buddy. Anytime. <laughs> come in with a few comments here and there. So this is actually very exciting for me because one of the things that I'm most interested in about the local scenes, plural, uh, in Southeast Asia, is um, kind of documenting the history. And we talked about it a little bit where you know this is generally going to be your story oh. and your involvement in the local scene, okay. and, and not necessarily the. Um, uh, the be all end all of, of the history of Filipino yes. punk and hardcore, yes. but I think you know your insight yeah. is is very valuable to us just because I was too young to see really what was happening yes. in, in in the early days, mm -hmm. and I know Ian was much more involved in the scene back then, but also missed uh, a lot of the, uh, the earlier the earlier part of it. Yeah. So Al, let's talk about your background. 
where did you grow up and uh, what were you listening to musically? Actually, I grew up here in the Philippines. I, and before we started to play punk, uh, we already had a band. We used to play Led Zeppelin and Black Sabbath covers, you know how it is. It was sometime back in 1984 when we attended our first punk gig. And that was like, that was, that gave me some sort of an epiphany and, and told me like, this is what I wanted, I want to be doing the rest of my life. This, this is the kind of music that I was looking for. Uh, when, when we were still playing classic rock, so to speak, um, there was a void. I, said, I, I wasn't really happy with it. We were playing covers and stuff, but I wanted to write my own songs. I used to write my own songs, but then... Uh, I didn't feel that that was the right vehicle for my songs, and then I came across punk rock, and I felt immediately, immediately felt that this was it, this was it, and well, the rest as they say is history. So we started like writing our own songs. First, we started doing covers, and then we started to write our own songs, and came up with an album and stuff. So there, uh, we came up with four albums and uh, three of which were released by Twisted Red Cross during the heyday of punk. So that's, that was between, uh, that was from 85 to around 89. So that was when the punk was really alive here. So there. Um, you, uh, you said that you uh, discovered the, the music uh, through a, a punk um, concert, your first yeah. punk concert. Trinity. Uh, Trinity. Uh, At Trinity and, College, and who were playing. Yeah. Um, the ones who came before us, like Arnold, Urban Bandits, I think Woods was, was also in the lineup. But Urban Bandits was the band that like really made an impact on us. I, actually, I was there with my brother Jay. Um, he was the co-founder of Dead Ends, and he's like, uh, and the reason why we actually disbanded, uh, the reason why the band died was because he died in ninety five, uh, in ninety six. So, um, if he were alive today, probably Dead Ends would have been still alive. What did you make of the music when you first heard it? Well, it was loud. It was, it was, well, it was different in the sense that I was used to listening to like Led Zeppelin, Black Sabbath and stuff, who were all really very tight. But when I, when I watched those bands perform, they were loose, they were like, I'm not really that skilled in playing, but they were passionate about what they were saying, about what they were doing. And that was what hit me. I said, the passion in the music. Um, I and then after that, I read, about, I read about punk and stuff and found out that um, talent was not really a requisite to <laughs> punk rock. We all know that now. And so, but the message is, uh, well, yeah, the message was, uh, was what hit me. I mean, uh, punk came about due to, like, as a form of protest against, like, societal repression, boring societal norms in the states, against the government and stuff, and they were all free to do what they free to say what they want to sing about what they wanted back then um, probably because most of them like just release their their music independently and, and that's what I wanted to do um, I wanted what punk stood for back then uh, and I believed in that and so so there and that's why I decided to do that and I've been doing that for more than Many years. You mentioned that one of the things that appealed to you was the message, which was um, anti-government, anti-anti-repression. I think it's 
it's definitely worth pointing out that at that period of time, at that period of time, uh, the Philippines was still under martial law. Yes, under the, yes, the Marcos it was. Dictatorship. And we were actually really pissed at the things that were going on back then, the repression, all the lies, all the propaganda coming out. So we wanted to, we wanted to have a vehicle to to say what say what we wanted back then and. Punk gave that to us. Punk gave us not only the vehicle, but but was this the courage to do that? Um, the uh, kids back then were like these punks. Uh, mind you, these punks were like teenagers, like 15, 16, 17. I was really, really young back then. And so, if you don't mind me asking, how old were you? Uh, I was back then. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, Fair enough. That's all you get. <laughs> <laughs> that's all you get. <laughs> well, the, reason, the, reason, the reason why I asked... No, but I was really, really young. Okay. Uh, I was the, barely out of my teens. Okay. Uh, the only reason why I ask is um, I have heard that there were numerous um, student groups who were active uh, against the dictatorship, and so I was just uh, curious just if you were Just very party. few. Yeah. But uh, these teenagers also came together and listened to what we had to say. And they believed in what he said, and I would like to believe that uh, we were somehow responsible for bringing about change in the government back then. I would were, like to believe that. Were, were you politically active before Pompok? Yes, Park? yes. Uh, actually, I was in EDSA during the EDSA revolution. I was there for three days, and a lot of my songs were based on what I felt back then. Second Coming was released in 86, by 87, after the Edsa Revolution. So that's why a lot of the songs in Second Coming, our second album, obviously, uh, were about Marcos, about, about the dictatorship, about how he was booted out of power, about what we did during that particular point in time. So, the Second Coming was not only a piece of musical history, it was also a piece of political history, so to speak.
especially under martial law, is very difficult to get the music, to hear about the music. Um, yes. So I'm, I'm curious how you guys got music in those days. Was it tape trading? Was it all Ah, uh, Yes, tape trading. But actually, one radio station really helped in spreading the music. It's DZRJ, um, particularly Howling Dave. He had a couple of shows back then, Pinoy Rock and Rhythm and Rock and Roll Machine, but I think, but uh, he, he, yeah, you were so young, you wouldn't know. Pinoy Rock and Rhythm, um, where he featured a lot of these underground punk bands, and sometimes he played Sex Pistols, Dead Kennedys on air. Nobody did that back then in any other radio station, and it sort of helped create awareness of this punk movement, even even among non-punks, so to speak. Rockers were non-punks. Uh, so eventually, the movement became bigger because of that. And not only was punk rock, local punk rock, an exclusive thing, but a lot of people were, were sort of curious about what this phenomenon was. So, um, another, another, another thing that helped was Jingle Magazine. Jingle Magazine also like featured a lot of articles about the bands. Uh, they interviewed us. They reviewed punk, punk records, and so that also raised consciousness about the punk scene back then. So the funny thing is that we were just having fun. We didn't know that we were making history. We didn't know that. In 10 or 20 years from now, people will be looking back at us and say, wow, that was something else. We didn't know that back then. We were just kids having fun, fucking around, and just um, playing loud music. Uh, we didn't care if we were good. If we, we didn't care if people... Actually, pe a lot of people hated us. Now, I mean... Uh, the, those who didn't understand what the music was, um, in our in our neighborhood, we used to rehearse three or four times a week, and everyone hated us. Everyone hated the noise that we were creating back then, and I think that was the that was the general that was the general feeling that non punks didn't uh, that non punks had about the music back then. This was noisy. This was trash. Even the some rockers felt that punk was sacrilegious to heavy metal <laughs> back then. Really, really, it was just later on when heavy metal and punk sort of merged. But during the early days of the local punk scene, punks hated heavy metal. Punks hated the hated the rock star mentality of heavy metal. Punks hated the fact that you had to have talent to play heavy metal. <laughs> and punks didn't like, ah, didn't like the like long solos and stuff. And long hair and that. Uh, punks, punk bands, uh, punk bands hated heavy metal so much that every, they felt that they stood for everything that is contradictory to heavy metal. Heavy metal musicians had long hair, so punks cut their hair short. Um, heavy metal musicians always like had like really long solos in their in their in their songs, so punks didn't want to like have solos in theirs. And Punks, uh, heavy metal had like four or five, six minute songs. And that's why punks wanted like 30 seconds or 40 second songs. So, so they, they're poles apart, uh, literally. But towards like around the latter part of the 80s, I think things started to gel. Heavy metal and so much that a lot of punk bands who originally hated heavy metal, started to cross over, and a lot of things changed, the music changed, so there. Yeah.
how much of uh, the music that you were writing uh, in the early days was a reaction to to what you were talking about against like the norms of having long songs, having very uh, Actually, I was against the norm of being against this. Okay. I see and that's why I, I felt, hey, punks didn't want solos. So I, I did solos. <laughs> <laughs> so I'm against that norm, that kind of attitude that is against certain things that are good. So although, although I'm against a lot of stuff, and although I am with the pulse, as far as the other things are concerned, it was selective for me. I believed in what I believed. I didn't believe in what they believed in. I had my own beliefs. So I, that's why I, if, you, if you listened to our album back then, not now, because people now have a broader understanding of the music. And they are more, people now are more forgiving actually. But back then, uh, punks were less forgiving about the music. If you played something different from what they liked, they hate you. The, really, that was how it was. Playing. But we didn't care about that also. Uh, we took punk rock, the attitude, a step further because we went against what the punks wanted back then. So they didn't want solos, we did solos. They didn't want like more than three chords. Like you put six or seven in one song. How big of a scene are we talking about back then? Um, how do you define big? I'm, I, I just, I'm just trying to get a, a, a feel for how many yeah. people would show up at a show. Depends on, just like today, depends on which bands are playing. Now, uh, if you're going to like put Urban Bandits, Woods, Private Stock, Betrayed, and well, Dead Ends in one gig, everyone will be going for sure. But every now and then, like Urban Bandits, depends, it really depends. Uh, uh, and the good thing about it is that uh, there are what they used to call tribes. Um, there was a tribe in Santa Mesa, there was a tribe in, um, in Manila, different parts of Manila, and there was a tribe in Novotas Malabon. So it depends on, on who is playing at a particular time. And for example, like a band from Malabon and Novotas will be playing all the tribe members from Malabar and Abadas will be true to that. So it's really big. But if you like put together bands that have followings everywhere, then wow, that was good. Um, but that rarely happens because like organizers back then wanted to space out these bands and not put them, to, lump them together in one game. Uh, the good thing is that um, have you heard about Brave New World? Of course, of course you did. Uh, possibly. A uh, Brave New World is a series of concerts back then that Tommy Tan Chang used to hold, okay. and and that was probably the most well attended series of concerts back then because everyone wanted, all the bands wanted to play there, and that's why that's why it was always a big thing, like. Are we talking uh, a few hundred people? Uh, yeah, yeah, like 500, 600 people at okay. the time. It's a, it's a, it's a big open air thing. Okay. In Phil Trade, it, it's not there anymore. But it was a big open air thing. And, uh, Tommy used to hold it like once every three or four months and stuff. And it was always big. Uh, in between, there was Katrina's. And uh, Matemias gigs, which were a lot smaller. These were the venues? Ah, uh, yeah, venues. And Katrina's was a bar. It used to be a girly bar. <laughs> but the owner decided to convert it into a, a band, band venue, a band gig venue every weekend, every, every Saturday. So, like, 
two or three bands would play, and like around a hundred people would come at a time and stuff. So it depends. But it, it was big. The movement was big. Although the focus was in Metro Manila, mm -hmm. uh, the awareness was huge. Uh, the whole country knew that there was a punk scene in Metro Manila. Uh, so much so that uh, after a time, pocket tribes or pocket communities uh, were created in different areas, like in Bulacan, Cebu, and even in Bagan, even in a long couple, so there. Did, uh, did you get to tour the the other areas? Yeah, um, we, we used to go to Alonga a lot, um, but unfortunately, uh, the last concert, punk concert that was held back then there. Um, there was a falling out between Manila-based punks and Alangapo-based punks, and we didn't go back there anymore. And it was it was it was really violent and stuff. <laughs> Revolution. Mm -hmm. um, I am. I'm curious if there was any kind of like political or government or police presence or surveillance over the punk scene at the time. Yeah. Yes. But well, there was always police presence, which was actually uh, kind of normal back then. So we didn't really, we didn't really think it was out of the ordinary. They had a curfew. You had a curfew back then, during Marshall. Uh yes, but towards the Later, uh, towards the mid '80s, martial law was already lifted. Oh yeah. Martial law was already lifted, so there, there, there was no curfew anymore. It was theoretically lifted, but yeah, you know, you know how it is. 
Uh, anyway, uh, police presence, yes. There was always police presence, but they used to just stay outside. Whenever things got rough, that's when they jump in and, hey, stop this. So they were, they were more concerned about the, the fights and the violence yes, rather, yes, than yes. rather than ra any kind of political I, ramifications or anything like no, that? No, no, no. Well, there was this thing I, I used to hear about, because some of, the, some of them were involved in the movement. Uh, there were like uh, a lot of us. Yeah, they were involved in the move movement. So uh, I guess it was to a point. Some of the kids at the show who related to the music and were their friends were also uh, sympathetic towards rebels. So I guess like see, Chikoy would tell a story that he'd never take the same route home. Ah, uh, yes. Yeah, because he was he was really active in, in the... He was, well, what, was he communist back then? What was his uh, I thing? Know. I, I don't know, but actually, if you... If you he, he was vocal again about things, about what was happening back then, as we were. Mm. Uh, in fact, a lot of us were more vocal than he was. Yeah. We knew there was always a threat that we would be picked up. There was always that thought behind our behind our minds that that we don't know if we'll like when we go out of the venue that cops will be like waiting for us. But fortunately, that didn't happen. But we knew we knew that it was a distinct possibility back then. Uh, but fortunately, nothing of the sort happened to us there. It was a scarier time back then. Yeah. It was a scarier time, but punk gave us a courage, actually. Punk, punk rock gave us a courage. Punk rock gave a lot of kids courage to speak up against the government. And I guess the government just didn't understand what it was. The, the government, Marcos, just didn't know what was going on. He had bigger concerns. Mm. He had bigger concerns. He had bigger fish to fry. He had bigger fish to massacre. He left them to the church and the conservatives. <laughs> oh, you handle these. Uh, <laughs> actually, these and, and the mainstream media was against us. Um, only like Jingle and those who really understood what the music was all about. They were the ones who were sympathetic to the punk scene, to the punk rockers. They understood, but the mainstream media always, um, always drew a picture of us that wasn't that was really that good. Like we were, we were accused as being satanists. Uh, uh, punks, satanists! Wow, that is that's that's really funny. I think uh, we talked about this on the last podcast yeah. where. Uh, when when you were a kid, you heard stories about like the punk rockers and recto being satanists. I uh, I used to see uh, this girl from well, she wasn't my girlfriend or anything. She was a good she was a good friend, and we went the same music lesson or mm -hmm. whatever it was we were doing back then. And uh, my mom and I would pick her up from this school somewhere in Manila, San Andres Street, right? Mm -hmm. And then there were a bunch of punks hanging out in front of the little mini mart. <laughs> And it's right in front of the church of their school. They have a, they have a church, and then you see it's literally the the nuns and some of the teachers are like trying to block the entrances of the school. <laughs> it was hilarious. Yeah, yeah. But I'm 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 assuming that the Philippines being the Philippines, the same kids who are accused of being being Satanists would also show up for church on Sunday, right? So yeah, some of them. Okay. All right. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. There was no real letting go. Like, not, not, not like now where people are more open about having faith or not having faith. Because back then it was all about image. So, so you're like, you're, you're a weekday Satanist. <laughs> if that makes any sense. But actually, punks were not really Satanists back yeah. then. Uh, they weren't. Uh, they were accused being Satanist, but they weren't. Really. Yeah, that's that's an important uh, point that uh, 
uh, that we need to make, which was that it was it was the media bias, and I guess the media yeah, yeah, the, yeah, the media always always had a particular image of us. Uh, we always like, and uh, what's this? The attire didn't help. <laughs> they started the hairdo the didn't help. Like you, the, the anarchy box. symbol, right? The anarchy symbol. They thought it was satanic. It's yeah, just, and and, and the hair. Yeah. And they thought that uh, the spikes in the hair are like horns. <laughs> <laughs> my father thought of that, not, not me, not, not Jay. Our father, yeah, well, we have to talk about him a bit because he was one of the driving forces of the band. In other words, he supported us, he paid for our albums, he was the one that paid for our albums, he was the one that financed our albums. He drove us to our gigs, he bought our equipment, he bought our gear. Without him, we wouldn't have any money to maintain the band. So, Dead Ends existed because of him. There. And, he, well... Did he pitch the name to you, or...? Yes, he did, and he said... We were thinking of a name. We were actively thinking of a name. We were... We were, like, brainstorming and coming up with options possible and he said why not dead ends because we we wanted a name that was ridiculous that was funny that wasn't serious that wasn't that wasn't like uh that wasn't that defines who we are it defines dead ends why dead ends i asked them because we we'll, we live in Avatas, it is a dead end. <laughs> that's, that's his, that was his first reason. Okay, and what, what, what else? And nothing, it just sounds nice. He said, okay, good, we have a name. Dead end. So there's nothing really profound about the whole thing. It is a great name for a punk band, though. Yeah. We found it funny. 
Your father really looked dead ends. Wow. Well, so there. I would like to talk about Twisted Red Cross a little bit and right. the relationship with the label because it is um, it does seem like something like you know in the barrier punk scene had um, alternative tentacles and you know there's SST and it's, it's almost like every every scene needs a record company to a certain extent or somebody yeah um, how did you how did you get involved with Twisted Red Cross actually our relationship with Twisted Red Cross was kind of different from the relationship of the other bands. That yeah, when we started playing in Brave New World, and when Tommy, when Tommy learned about us, and uh, he wanted to produce our album, but we said no. We wanted to produce the album ourselves, our first album ourselves. Complaints. Um, he already came out with the compilation album Rescularis and You and Barricades on tape. And he already had a record for his own band, Chaos. He was in a band at the time as well. Ah, yeah, he was in band Chaos. And, and which came out with a major label release. <laughs> <laughs> but the first TRC record was Rescularis and You and Barricades, which is a compilation album of different punk bands back then um, but when we started playing we wanted to come up with our own album we had a lot of songs and we wanted to we wanted to like, just put it out uh, so we decided to we decided to come out with the album and when Tommy learned about this he wanted to produce our album but we said no as I said we said no he was insistent uh, and so, but so we arrived at the compromise. Okay, um, we will produce the album ourselves. Uh, you help us with the production, but we finance it ourselves and stuff. We market it ourselves. We produce it. Uh, uh, we produce it ourselves. The album, and and he will be in charge of marketing, distribution because he had the know-how. And he knew where to like put out these cassettes. So, uh, on the condition that we use the Twisted Red Cross label. So. Why do you think he was so insistent that? Uh, I don't know. He probably guys... liked our music. Okay. <laughs> I don't know, but or probably because we were the very first band who was ready to come out with an album back then. Nobody had like enough original songs yet, probably. But we were ready, we wanted to. So okay, so we arrived at a compromise. Uh, we produced the album ourselves. He, uh, we didn't know anything about recording, so he would help us. He helped us with the recording and stuff, although I wasn't really happy with how it turned out. Talk about why. You, you did talk about it a little bit in the Shock and Awe uh, article, but uh, what was it you didn't like about the, the complaints recording? The recording itself. Um, we went into the studio. I had lots of ideas about how to do things, how, how the sound that we wanted. But he booked us into an eight track studio. An eight track studio. Five tracks were already used up by the drums. So we had one track for bass, one track for guitar, and one track for vocals. Just one for each. Had he recorded before? Did he know? Uh, yeah, yeah. Okay. Well, he recorded his own band. Okay. Uh, I bet that was a minimum of 16 tracks. Uh, so he booked us into an eight track studio. My God. So, and he didn't want me to use a, a distortion. So I had to like plug direct to. The amp, oh, the amp was good. Still, it wasn't my sound. It wasn't that wasn't my sound. Whenever I played live, I used to like. I wanted a wall of sound every time. But how, how would you compare the uh, the sound that you guys had live versus the sound that that people heard on the recording? In the first album, it was different. It was totally different because we were like our our hands were tied back then with what we were given. So we were just given eight tracks and five tracks were just, were all ready for the drums. And 
Wow, there, there wasn't even any backing vocals. I was, I, I had plans on how to do the backing vocals, how to do the overdubs, and all that stuff, but it didn't happen. So, so there. Uh, so that when we, when it was time to come out with our second album, we told them we wanted them at least 16 tracks this time. And I already knew how to go about doing things in the recording studio. So I don't want you in there. That's one of the conditions. <laughs> I don't want you in there. Okay, and so the second album, Second Coming, is the sound I really wanted. That would have been what complaints the first album would have sounded had I been given total control in the recording. So there. So I was really pissed off. I was really pissed off. I was, if I could do the whole album all over again, I would. But well, it's there. It's a good thing. Some people liked it. Would you? As it was. <laughs> as would it you was. consider re-recording it as throw? I know. And uh, just probably one or two tracks, but um, if well, if Jay were still alive today, right. then we would probably re-record it as Dead Ends. But the reason I did not use Dead Ends as a name for my next band was because Jay was an, was an integral part of Dead Ends. Uh, his creative ideas, his creative input was critical to the music that we produced back then. So much that if it wouldn't be right coming up with another Dead Ends band without him because he was an integral part of the, of the band. So I just used a different thing. Uh, what was the response to, um, to complaints when it came out? like locally and... What was the response of the punks? Yeah. Of the, yeah, they liked it, actually, fortunately. It was the very first full-length album release of a band, aside from the mainstream, mainstream release of Chaos. It was the first full-length underground punk release of any band here in the Philippines. Aside from chaos, of course, but that doesn't count because that's a that's a mainstream release. Well, what format was it released on? Cassette. Cassette, just okay. cassette. So there. So uh, after that, well, things just picked up and bands started to be signed up in TRC, and everything followed. Do you think that uh, the fact that you guys were the first DIY full length? helped their cachet and that people wanted to sign with them because yeah, of you guys? Yes, yeah. I think so. I think so. I would like to believe so. And it gave other people the impetus to come up with their own albums and say, wow, Dead Ends was able to do that and we can do that too. Let's do it and stuff. Did you realize it was a milestone at the time? No. Or were you guys just kind of no, doing your thing? No, no. We were just like, as I said, not even until the end of the scene itself in the 90s. We didn't know that after 10 or 20 years, people would look back and say that, wow, that was a big thing back then. No, because to tell you the truth, we, we thought that we were the only ones taking ourselves seriously back then. We were having fun, oh, to hell with everything. And we didn't know that our music would influence a newer generation. A few, a few years after after the demise, so to speak. Now, I wouldn't say demise. Uh, I'll explain that later. Uh, the punk scene didn't really die. It just went into a coma and woke up towards the turn of the millennium again. Anyway, uh, when I started hearing that, Bands came out afterwards because they listened to Dead Ends. Uh, you were uh, influenced, stuff like that, people. That's when I started to realize that, hey, uh, we were influential after all. And so that's when I started to realize that it was a big thing. What we did was 
musically significant. Uh, but back then it was like we just we just screwed around actually. We just did what we wanted to do. And we just we were just having fun. That's it. How aware were you at the time of what was going on um, in other parts of Southeast Asia or maybe other parts of the world? No, I'm not really aware of Southeast, the, the other yeah. countries in Southeast Asia. Was there any... Although I was, uh, I used to read about what was happening in the U.S. and okay. in Europe, but Southeast Asia, no, not really. So, there was no real connection with like other punk scenes, other... Not that much, although some people started writing us. You know, there's still, there, there was an email yet. Right. So people started to actually write us snail mail to ask for like trades okay. and stuff. And so we would oblige. Oh. And uh, some some zinesters people came out with zines used to mail us zines featuring reviews of our album like there was a one particular zine that 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 was out that i was proud of was the one was one from germany which had which published a review of second coming a rave review of second coming and i clearly remember that the reviewers wrote now this is better than 90% of the big name bands in the US he said that uh, so wow that was good I although I didn't believe it but that was a good thing to say <laughs> I, I have a friend from Malaysia Joe yeah Joe Kidd Joe Kidd the, the legend <laughs> yeah and he kept on saying that um, he was amazed to learn that there was a scene in the Philippines <laughs> back then. I, he didn't know that there was one. And then when he learned about the scene here in the Philippines, he wanted to learn more. So he wrote to the bands. He even wrote to me, he said, but I didn't answer. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, he wasn't Joe Kid in quotes back then. Back he was, then, uh, he was it just was, another punk. He was kid. just another punk. <laughs> and, and, and he was really amazed to learn. And he, like, um, got these tapes and let his friends hear it, listen to them. And that was one of the reasons why Malaysian punk rock grew, because of the influence of the Philippine scene. That's what he said. I believe it, uh, 100%. Um. Because we, as, as far as I know, there wasn't a real punk scene in Malaysia until the early 90s. And so it would have been past like what you guys were doing yes. with Dead Ends until... And, um, no, what, what was the, they, what motivated them was the fact that they said, the Philippines was able to do it, we can do it too, so come on, let's do this and stuff. That's what, that's what he said and, and that felt good. <laughs> that we didn't only influence our countrymen, but we were also a big influence in other countries.
So in the early 2000s, um, you came back with Throw. Yes. With, I believe, your brother-in-law and... Yes. Yeah. Actually, before the turn of the millennium, around 1998, 99, uh, he wanted to come up with a band, but didn't have the right people. Then I talked to my brother-in-law, Dennis, because I know, I knew that he played the bass. And he said, Dennis, come on, let's put up a band. Wait, wait, before this, uh, there, was, there was another episode. Lord and I started playing around and jamming Lord de Vera. That was around 98, And uh, we wanted to do something. So we came up with a band and we came up with the name Throw. But we didn't get past rehearsing. Like we had like three years old, we didn't even like play a gig and we disbanded. The band died a natural death because we were so busy. And then, uh, then, then it happened that I wanted to come up with the band again. I talked to Dennis and so on and so forth. And I pitched the idea around and Oji got hold of the idea and told me that he wanted to play drums for me. And he was, yeah, I don't know how he got wind of the idea. And he referred his friend, see, Bane Boy, who, like, who he was in a band with also, to play the guitars for us. Okay, I told him I don't want to play the guitar, I just want to do the vocals so that it would be different from Dead Ends. Uh, that was the reason why I didn't, I didn't play the guitars for the first generation of them. I wanted our physical appearance would be different from what we had back then in Dead Ends. Because if people would see me like holding the guitar and singing, they associate it with Dead Ends automatically. Hey, it's Dead Ends again. But no, I wanted it to be different. So we were four and then uh, I was... We, we, we started rehearsing and when it was time to come up with a name, I just said, why don't we use throw again? We didn't, we weren't able to like gig with this when we started, when we, when Lourdes and I started jamming. So we might as well use this. So we did, we, we used that name. Things started picking up and we come, came up with our own album around 2001, a year after. 2002, I think. And we came up with some sort of a group of Manila-based bands, uh, main, including Demi Urge, and a lot of other bands, End of Man, Tenda de Kabalang, Talk, those who were active then. And we started coming up with our own gigs. And that went on for around a few years before uh, we started to go our separate ways again. <laughs> Was there anything uh, musically you wanted to do with Throw that you didn't or couldn't do with Dead Ends? Not really. I didn't look at it that way. I look at it more as a continuation of what I used to do. Uh, it was a natural progression, so to speak. A natural progression in terms of musical influences, a natural progression in terms of style, and in terms of recording abilities and stuff. Um, if I had my way, I would have recorded our past albums differently. I would have improved on this, on that, and so many other things. And, and that is why when we started to record our albums, at the outset I decided I want to be the one to mix and master our own albums. So I, used to, I still do that until now. So I mix and ma I, I used to just mix and master in the first. I mixed and mastered our first album, although someone else recorded it. And from the second album, onwards, uh, we recorded everything ourselves. So it's really a DIY effort. Back then in Dead Ends, we were at the mercy of the recording engineer. 
So there. So we have we have more control right now over how our music sounds and how our music put what no how our music sounds and how it is created so to speak so so far you've released uh four albums with throw yes including and one, one that just came out and one ep and one ep mm -hmm. including an album that just came out this month mm -hmm. correct yes um it uh for anyone who wants uh to purchase the album or order the album uh is there a website is there a Actually, we're doing a website right now, which we will be launching in a couple of weeks. Uh, I wanted to come up with a website so that the dissemination of information would be centralized. And, and right now, people rely on social media for information regarding throw and what our next gigs would be, what our next projects would be. Um, but I wanted to go back to the old school, uh, not really old, old school, but the old school of like checking out websites and not the social media. Checking Look for out. For throw on Facebook, <laughs> Instagram. Yeah, yeah <laughs> see, I, I, wanted a, I wanted a real internet presence that does not rely on social media. Are you active on social media? Yes. I noticed uh, throw throw has a Facebook page that's yeah, 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 but I, I don't have time to like update that or I often just put things about the band in my own personal account. So that's where people learn about what I do, what he do in the band. So the last time I talked to Ian or the last time I did a podcast with Ian, we talked about the Dead Ends tribute. Mm -hmm. uh, how did that come about? Uh, ask him. <laughs> he's the he's the brainchild of. Anyway, but I think. Um, but you recorded uh, you recorded a few songs as throw one. right for yeah yeah, one song, yeah. recorded one. Yeah, that's the title track. That's the title cut of the album, and Ian did a very good job. On thank it. you, thank you. So it's uh, sh shall we file it under pending? Yeah, it's um, unfortunately, uh, most of the bands, they didn't really back out. It's just they don't have time. They don't have time. I understand completely the, the traffic situation is horrible now. And um, some of them, uh, I've do lost... Mean, do you mean literal physical traffic? As in yeah, cars? Yeah, as in, as in traffic jams. Yeah. It's, and the, the roads are all backed up. I understand that there are priorities... Yeah, of course. So. It's not something that... Of course, these bands would prioritize their own albums and their own projects. Some bands are getting together just to be part of it. Again, so like, some of them are just... are no longer bands to start with. And I just managed to convince them. Because to me, mm. it's important that these people... I, I've literally hand-selected these bands. Mm. Sooner or later, it'll come out. <laughs>
we're actually finishing up right now. Uh, mm -hmm. The other thing that Ian sent me, uh, I guess a few months back, was you did a, I guess like a, an internet broadcast, an internet... Uh, a radio broadcast. Yeah, a radio broadcast. Yeah, yeah, I just wanted people to have an idea of the album. Uh, I played tracks from the album. But that, that was two or three months before we actually released the album and at that point the mix was still rough but I wanted to give them an idea so I set up an account at Mixler and told my friends on Facebook that hey I'll be doing some sort of a show tonight around two hours nine to Eleven, I'd be playing tracks from the new album and a few tracks from the older albums just to keep things interesting uh, and some tracks from our friends' albums. Is that something you enjoy doing? doing uh... Yeah, I actually enjoyed it. I actually enjoyed it, but I hardly talked. So I just let the music do the speaking. So I, uh, what I did was I just gave them a bit of a background of how we came up with the songs. Like this was written for this, blah blah blah, and so on and so forth. And something that they wouldn't be able to to know any other way. So there. So I just, I I think I did it twice. Yeah. The reason why I asked if it was something that you enjoyed is. Uh, you you seem to be somebody who has a lot to say, and I think what you have to say is is something that people need to hear. And you're also somebody who, with uh, with throwing dead ends, uh, comments on the scene, comments on the hardcore scene and punk rock in general. Yeah. Um, and we're at a very strange place where, with my my broad view of the local scenes, we don't have many elder statesmen. We don't have many people who have the context and the history of where this music came from, you know, what it's gone through to where, what's happening now. So I'm actually curious if you'd be interested in doing your own podcast, because I think that's something that people would really enjoy. Yes, but I don't have... Okay, because I, I don't know if you can tell, but anybody can do a podcast. I know, I know. <laughs> I know, but um, I haven't really thought about it. Okay. Seriously. You well, should. Probably we can talk about it some other time. Yeah. Do you have any uh, anything that uh, you'd like to say? Anything you'd, you want to finish up with? Yes. Um, just one thing that I sort of feel bad about regarding the new bands that are coming out right now in the underground scene. Most of these new bands are happy with just sounding like somebody else. And like, ah... Uh, they don't use their idol bands, their idols, as their influence. They mimic the sound of their idols, lock, stock, and barrel, as I said. They even use stock slogans that their idols say on stage, and they do that as well. Like, the problem with the younger bands right now is that they don't exert an effort to come up with an original sound. They're happy with sounding like their idols, which should not be, should never be the case. Uh, and this is the reason why some bands, some group of bands sound the same, because they are all happy with sounding like their idols. Hey, we sound like this, we sound like that, we sound like this. Purposely, being eclectic is something that sometimes it's hard to avoid. Like you get influences here and there, and you come up with a totally new thing. But when you get something, the whole thing, and use it as your own without changing anything, that's a totally different matter altogether. And that's what most fans like. Where's the originality? Uh, they don't have to have their own style. They just have to have their own sound. Style and sound are two different things. You may all play the same style, 
but one should sound different from the others. Stupid people might love you, <laughs> but would you rather be loved by stupid people rather than people who really think and appreciate good music? So there. Awesome. I, I don't think we're going to top that. Thank you so much, Al. Okay. <laughs> You're welcome. We won't tell the world, alright! When that time comes, I won't 